you have a Bible, go ahead and turn with me uh, to the Old Testament book of Judges, uh, the Old Testament book of, of Judges, uh, chapter 3, starting in verse 16. Cameron or somebody, can you help me get a few lights up in the, in the room today? Uh, Judges, again, Judges 3.16. Hopefully, as you walked in today, uh, there is a, uh, you received a bulletin, uh, with blanks for you uh, to be able to keep engaged with what we're talking about today. Again, uh, Judges chapter 3, uh, starting in, uh, in verse 16. Um, I do want to mention a, a few things. Uh, first of all, again, it was nice uh, last week. Uh, if you were here, Jim Quick, who's our um, who's a camp manager at Bond Christian Service Camp. He also preaches out at St. Elmo. We did a pulpit swap, so I was out in uh, St. Elmo, and he was here and was was thankful to be able to do that. Enjoy uh, going to preach elsewhere, but uh, there is nothing like home in that sense, and so uh, glad to be back uh, with you uh, today. Uh, Mike is is not here. If you've noticed, he hasn't actually been in the last couple of weeks. He's in Branson both weekends. I don't know if he's got a thing for Branson. I don't know what it is, but uh, no, he had uh, something with his wife the weekend before already scheduled, and then a baseball tournament, so he'll be back. So thank you, Alan and team, for uh, leading us uh, today in worship, but he will be back with us uh, next week. Um, again, Ma- uh, Judges 3.16, I want to I remind you guys the series we're in. We're in this series called The Great 316s. And we've, we've kind of flip-flopped back and forth uh, between the Old Testament and New Testament. Uh, we started in, on Easter Sunday in John 3.16. Uh, you guys, many remember that conversation he had uh, with Nicodemus there that night. Uh, then we went to Joshua 3.16, which we're going to refer to that today. Back in the New Testament, 2 Timothy 3.16 was a couple weeks ago. And today we're back in the Old Testament in Judges. One of the things I want to remind you of is we, uh, we believe, in fact, 2 Timothy 3.16 says the Word of God is all inspired. It's all useful for teaching and rebuking and the training up in righteousness and correcting as well. And so we believe that, that the very Word of God is inspired, both the Old Testament and New Testament is both inspired. But we recognize that the chapters and verses were given at a later point to help us navigate God's Word. And so what, what we've noticed, though, is that there are these 316 passages that seem to kind of show God's redemptive plan time and time again. And so we're looking at some of these key passages that if you just looked up the chapter and the verse, again, those are not necessarily inspired, but yet these are God's redemptive plan to us. And so we're finding this uh, together in the book of Judges. Let me give you a little bit of just a... Uh, just a summary, uh, a, a bit of the book of Judges before we get into it. Uh, the book of Judges uh, is, is an interesting book because it's right after the Israelites take hold of that promised land. And what you see is they're kind of in, the, in, in between uh, places. They had, at, at first there was a theocracy in the sense that they were led by God or led by the priest. And then eventually they wanted a king. If you remember this, the, the text, they wanted to be a king because they wanted to be like the other nations. And so they move into a monarchy. But between that, they, they have this uh, period of time led by judges. And in the book of Judges, there's 12 judges that's talked about. There's six ones that are major judges, six are minor. And kind of like the Old Testament, you have the minor uh, prophets and you have the major prophets. The only difference, not that, that God used them in, in, in one way in a major and another in a minor. Major and minor just means that we have more information about them. And so uh, what we see is we see six major prophets, we're gonna, or uh, uh, judges, we're going to see one of those today in Ehud, who was a major prophet, but you have these six minor. And you see this cycle of, of uh, that throughout the book. In fact, let's go ahead and put that next screen, uh, uh, that next picture on the screen. You see the cycle of sin and judges. You actually see it seven different times. So if you look at the, if you look at your, uh, at that about like one o'clock as you look at that, it, it shows Israel falling into sin and idolatry. And then you see Israel is oppressed by enemies. Israel cries out to the Lord. God raises up a judge. Israel is delivered. Israel serves the Lord. And then we fall into this. Israel falls into sin and idolatry. You see this about seven different times throughout the book of Judges. Different names and somewhat different sins, although they're very related to one another. And God uses other nations to oppress his people to basically bring them back uh, to him. Um, and so we see this. Now, I want you to understand when we talk about judges, we're not talking about like Judge Judy or anything like that. All right. This is not a civil leader. This is not a criminal leader, nothing like that. Judges, in fact, your blank there is more of a military or a uh, warrior uh, leader. That's the kind of judge we're going to see, and you're going to absolutely see that today in the story of of Ehud. And so we're going to look at this uh, text together. It's just 18 verses. Uh, It's a unique text. Many of you guys may be familiar with this story. and we're going to bring it back, this 316, to the New Testament at the end. So we're going to, I'm going to kind of tell the story. You have some blanks there to fill out some notes. I'm going to read the story to you, kind of highlight some major points, and then pull four things out of it that we will do together. But before we do this, let's take a moment and let's pray together.
Uh, Father, we are uh, so very grateful to be able to be here today. We, we recognize there are, uh, there are, are thousands and thousands of people doing this exact same thing all over the world, uh, celebrating you, remembering you. I'm praying today that whatever your word has for us today that is the most important thing, that whatever we have this afternoon that gets put to the side, that your word gets the focus of our heart. Lord, teach us uh, from your word, uh, humble our spirits, that whatever you have to teach us is, again, the most important thing. So pr- uh, put that on our minds, our hearts, focus our hearts on what you have to teach us. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we look at this text, again, Judges chapter 3, verse 12, and again, if you don't have a Bible, it will be on the screen, but take that Bible and the, uh, and the chair in front of you. That's our gift to you. Let's read through this, starting in verse 12. It says this, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. In fact, if you look at verse 11, it won't be on your screen, but verse 11 says, so the land had peace for 40 years until Othniel, son of uh, Kenaz, died. And so Othniel was that first judge. They had this 40 years of peace, and then according to that cycle, what happens? They sin, uh, sin, they call out to God, Lord, uh, Lord, guide us, direct us, and, and then we have at this point, we have Othniel come, Othniel dies, here they fall into sin again. It doesn't, doesn't tell us what kind of sin it was, we just know they fell into sin again. It says again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, verse 12, and because they did this evil, the Lord gave Eglon, king of Moab, power over Israel. Getting the Ammonites and Amalekites to join him, Eglon came and attacked Israel, and they took the possession of the city of Palms. Verse 14, the Israelites were subject, Eglon, king of Moab, for 18 years. A couple things I want you to understand this again. They had this blessing of God for this 40 years. They fell into sin. They did contrary to what God had for them to do, and they fall into this. Another nation comes up upon them. Now, they've been fighting uh, with Canaan for all this time. They eventually take on that promised land. God gives that over to them. And Joshua chapter 20 talks about that finally happened, that God gave them uh, this area of, of Canaan, including Jericho as well. And there was this alliance that was formed. If you look at, again, your text here, we have Moab, we have Ammonites and Amalekites. Uh, these are basically nomadic people who, who really started fighting up against the Israelites. And what a really sad note in this text that you, if you just read it, you kind of miss it, but it says it took possession of the city of Palms. Well, the city of the Palms is Jericho. And you guys know the story probably in Joshua 6 and Israelites are marching around the city and, and God gives them in a miraculous way the, the city of Jericho. And because of their sin, the city of Jericho is taken away from it. So it's a really sad uh, 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 idea towards this, but this is where the Israelites uh, find themselves. Uh, the Lord had given that land, that promise, and all of a sudden these nations form this alliance and take it away. And then verse 15, it says this, again, again, this is talking about the cycle. Again, the Israelites, they cried out to the Lord, and he gave them a deliverer, Ehud, and a kind of an interesting commentary here, a left-handed man. Uh, the son of Gera the Benjamite, the Israelites sent him with tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Why they sent him with tribute? Well, they were under the power, they were under the thumb of the king of Moab, and so they were bringing him. And so there's a group of Israelites that were bringing this tribute, probably food, maybe clothing of some sort, whatever goods they were bringing this tribute to him, probably a large amount of, of supplies, uh, because uh, if you, you live in Illinois, so you know taxes are a lot, all right? They were taxed a lot as well, and so they're bringing these taxes to them. Not happy about it, but recognizing that's what they did because they were under the thumb of the Moabites. Verse 16, now Ehud had made a double-edged sword about a cubit long, which he strapped to his right thigh under his clothing. He presented the tribute to Eglon, king of, of Moab, who was a very fat man, all right? That's how the scripture describes him. After Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent on their way those who had carried it. But on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, Your Majesty, I have a secret message for you. The king said to his attendants, Leave us. And they all left. We'll pick up on the story in a, mo- in a moment. But I want you to see in this text, verse 15, it, is, it really is the grace of God that comes in, in verse 15. Because it says, again, the Israelites cried out, and he, being the Lord, gave them a deliverer. Did they deserve it? Absolutely not. But God's mercy allowed them to have this deliverer, and this deliverer was Ehud. Now, what is, what's unique about Ehud in this scripture? Well, he's a left-handed man. He's a left-handed man. Now, that may not be that unique in our world. I think it's like 10% of people. Any left-handers in here? Can we have a few? Maybe I should raise my left hand. Okay. We've got a handful of you unique people. Probably about 10% of the people in this room. Well, even in today's side, of course, there's a day for everything. Someday in August, I don't remember what it is, there's a left-handed day. All right? It's like a, it's, it's a thing. Or we celebrate uh, that idea of being left-handed. Well, in that culture, it was not. In fact, in a lot of ways, it was looked as a, a weakness or disability in parts. And so this left-handed idea is, is pointed out in that, 
because uh, of that idea from the culture. Now, something that's interesting about he is from the tribe of Benjamin, this Ehud, is that they're, they're in fact, later in the Judges talks about that a lot of the Benjamites were actually uh, left-handed, maybe a, a, tr- a genetic trait, or they just trained that way. They learned how to use their left hand where other cultures said, no, it is a disability. You do not do that. In fact, if you are left-handed, you learn to use your other hand. It was actually, it was actually encouraged with the tribe of Benjamin. And so, in fact, some one commentary I read this week said Benjamin's tribe was a tribe of southpaws, all right? If you know anything about baseball, it's, uni- it's good to have a left-hander coming out of your bullpen or whatever. It's just something, it's a different way of going about it. And so it really is unique in this text because it says that this Ehud was a left-handed man. And then it says he made a double-edged sword about a cubit long. If you don't know how long a cubit is, it basically from your fingertip to your elbow, all right? That's how long it was. And it says, he strapped it to his right thigh uh, under his clothing, all right? Now, again, if somebody was a warrior, which again, judges are a warrior, typically if you're right-handed, you would reach down to your left thigh and you would grab it from there. If you are left-handed, you would go the opposite way. So apparently, when they would do their, their search beforehand, like kind of like before you get on an airplane, that kind of search, once they're searching you, obviously, they, they apparently, they looked at the left leg, left thigh, they didn't really pay much attention to the right thigh. So he was able to go in the king because otherwise he would not have been able to go into there with this, this sword attached to him. It says it was attached to him, and he presented this to him, and after he presented the tribute, he went off. And then verse 19, something interesting happens here, and this is so cool the way it connects together. This was not planned, but the way it connects together in verse 19, it says, but on reaching the stone images near Gilgal. Now, for so the, you, those of you that were here a few weeks ago, we talked about Gilgal quite a bit. In fact, it'll be on your screen, but go back to Joshua chapter uh, 4, verses 18 through 20. Uh, Joshua chapter 4, 18 through 20. Here's what, here's what it says, uh, and just kind of bringing this back. If you remember, the Israelites at that point, they crossed the Jordan River. And if you remember, the waters were stopped miles and miles up as they were crossing the Jordan River. If you remember the, even the text, it was flood season at this point. So there would have been no way naturally, if it was not God's hand, there's no way they could have crossed the river. They would have all been dead. But they had to cross the river. We know that. And then in verse 18, it says this. And the priest came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant. That was basically God's presence to the people. It says this. No sooner that they had their feet on dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. So all these hundreds of thousands of people are crossing the Jordan, heading into this promised land that he had had given them. As soon as they step out of the Jordan River, as soon as they step out of it, the waters uh, flow back to flood stages again. God's hand. Verse 19, on the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. If you remember, if you were here a few weeks ago, you remember they were instructed as they were crossing the Jordan River to take these stones that were in the river. And these would have been large, large stones, not just little pebbles that are on the side. These would have been large stones. And they put those stones there. And here's what I often wonder. There would have been 12 of them for the 12 tribes. Here's what I wonder. Go back to your text in, Josh, in, in Judges uh, chapter 3. It says, in verse number, um, verse number 18, it says, after Ehud had presented the tribute, he sent them on their way, he had carried it. And so they're all going back after they give this tribute to Ehud, the, or Eglon, the king. Verse 19, but on reaching the stone images near Gilgal, he himself went back to Eglon and said, your majesty, I have a secret message for you. Here's what I wonder. Maybe there's a part that Ehud decided, I'm going to take my men back and get them into safety because I know I've got to do something i got to be a warrior. I've got to do something because this Eglon is causing, is doing what's evil. He was, he was not a good man. He was an evil man. And it was causing un, unfair, again, God's, God's people, God's remnant was supposed to take this land. He's taking this land. He's taking what was God's and what was Israelite's at this point. And so he was going to use him. Maybe, just maybe, he was going to make sure his men are safe. But here's what I often wonder. I often wonder if, if Ehud was supposed to do something but got scared. We get scared at times. And instead of, instead of delivering them, he just went back with his men. And then he went to Gilgal, and he saw those 12 stones. And he saw those memorial. Maybe it would have been 100 years later. We don't know. But these were large stones. These wouldn't have been able to be moved very easily. These were there. And maybe, just maybe, he looked at those stones and thought, this is a time that God rescued the Israelites. He was faithful to us then. He'll be faithful to us now. And at some point, something happened where he turned back around and went back to Eglon. 
He decided, I've got to do something, and so he went back. We don't know why, but something happened. Maybe he was even battling it as he's walking back, as he's heading these miles to, to, uh, to uh, Gilead at this point, uh, or Gilgal at this point, as he's heading back to Gilgal. Maybe, just maybe, he's thinking, i got to do something. He sees that, and he goes back. Let's pick up together in verse number uh, 20. Here's what it says. Ehud then approached him, uh, the king, so he approached Eglon, and uh, while he was sitting alone in the upper room of his palace and said, I have a message from God for you. And the king rose, as the king rose from his seat, and again, Eglon was feeling so good about himself, he's like, well, that's not strange. You know, I'm really a powerful man. Maybe really God in his polytheistic society, maybe there's many. Uh, he, so he was open to this message from God. Verse 21, he had reached with his left hand and drew the sword from his right thigh and plunged it into the king's belly. And then it goes into greater detail. Even the handle sank in after the blade and his bowels discharged. Ehud did not pull the sword out. Why? Well, the fat closed in over it. Then Ehud went out to the porch and he shut the doors of the, of the upper room behind him and locked him. So this message, this message from God. And, and I want to say, it's not that necessarily God said, hey, I want you. There's nothing in here that says the Spirit of the Lord sent him to go stab this man. He didn't say, thou shalt go be an assassin. That's not necessarily what was said there. But there, I think there was a calling from God. What was supposed to happen, we don't know. But this is what he did. Whether, I, again, I don't think this, God was saying that you ought to necessarily do this. But he knew he ought to do something because Eglon was doing something evil and he needed to stand up against him for his people. This is what the judge was supposed to do to represent God's people uh, to them. And he was bringing judgment. He was giving judgment. We don't know how much, too many times the Lord allowed uh, Eglon to potentially repent and he would not. And so we stabbed him and the sword is gone. And then we have verse 24. It says, after he had gone, the servants came and found the doors of the upper room locked. They said, he must be relieving himself in the inner room of the palace. That means what you think it means, all right? Because there's probably a restroom in there. So they waited, verse 25, they waited to the point of embarrassment. I've often wondered kind of, the best of my ability what that means is that the smell was so bad. Now, the smell wasn't so bad because he was, he was relieving himself. It's that when he, when he stabbed him, he went basically in all his innards and his gut was basically ripped open and it smelled awful. So I can imagine the guys, the servants are looking at each other, are you going, you going, you going? It's like, he must not be done yet, because the smell is still coming from that door. Verse, verse uh, 25, they waited to the point of embarrassment, but when he did not open the doors of the room, they took a key and unlocked them. They said, "Is enough's enough. And there they saw their Lord fall to the floor dead. When they waited, Ehud got away. It doesn't say how he got away. Um, there's, maybe it was through a window, maybe it was kind of like a, a, a prison break, kind of Shawshank Redemption idea where he's like going through the toilet. There's many things, people that actually actually went through the toilet uh, to, to escape, but we know he escaped out of there. He passed by the stone images that escaped in Sarai. When he arrived there, he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim, and the Israelites went down with him from the hills, with him following them. Verse 28, follow me, he ordered, for the Lord had given Moab your enemy into your hands. So they followed him down and took possession of the fords of the Jordan that led to Moab. They allowed no one to cross over, and at that time they struck down about 10,000 Moabites. Okay? And again, this was, it even says here, all vigorous and all strong, not one escaped to recognize this. This was absolutely the hands of God. The Israelites on their own could not have done this, much like crossing the Jordan rivers. God's hand was all over this, that only he would get the glory. Verse 30, that day Moab was made subject to Israel, and the land had peace for 80 years. Kind of a crazy story. Kind of a crazy story in, in that. So what's the lesson from this? I'm going to go through four lessons from this book. You know the story. Now let's go through the lesson. Lesson number one is don't lock yourself in the bathroom with an assassin. All right? No, that's not lesson number one. That's really not. Number one is this. Sin always causes more pain than we imagine. Isn't that true? Sin, oh, another way to say it is sin always takes us further than we ever think it's going to go. For those of you, uh, probably most in this room, I would recognize, uh, or I, I, I believe recognize that that there's a part of you that thought, you know, when you first made this decision, like, uh, it's not going to, it's not going to hurt anybody. It's not going to hurt me. And little by little, little by little, and eventually, before we know it, our life is blown up. Again, there's, that happens to so many of us here in, in this room. Uh, 12 through 14, if you look at 12, it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Doesn't say what it was. Doesn't say what they did. My guess is it had to do with following foreign gods. The reason they followed foreign gods was because of the, the perceived blessing that they'd receive in this. 
They, uh, again, they were fickle. They knew that the Lord uh, was their God. They'd watched him lead. They knew of these stories. They'd heard these stories time and time again. But yet that moment of instant gratification, they said, well, I'm going to follow this God or I'm going to follow that God. We don't know what they did, but they did what was evil. It is very possible Ehud did evil as well. We don't know. But here's what I know, at least this is true for me, is that so many times I fall into sin uh, when I come, become complacent. I just come, become complacent or maybe even become comfortable in my, in, in my faith. Like I, I just, I feel like, oh, you know, I, I've got this or, you know, like I, I watch God honor and bless something. I'm like, all right, God, I'm, it's all in your strength. It's all within your power. And then one of the things happen is, is like good things start happening. And so I start convincing myself, well, maybe, you know, well, I'd never say the words, but maybe I start believing I don't even, even need God. You know, it's me. I'm the one. And recognizing that that is not the case, but still in my mind, I start going that direction. And so sometimes one of our greatest dangers in life is our successes. Because our successes can foolishly uh, lead us to thinking that we don't need God. And maybe that's exactly where they were at. And little by little, they, they start turning away from God. And, these ble- and, and they, they start thinking the blessings because of themselves. That's one of the dangers of blessings because we can become too comfortable. In fact, there's a uh, Solomon writes in Proverbs 30, it won't be on your screen, but it says this, two things I ask of you, Lord. He says, do not refuse me before I die. Keep falsehoods and lies before me. And then he says this, give me neither poverty or riches. Well, why would he ask that? Give me neither poverty or riches. Well, he says, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I have too much, I, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or may become poor and steal and so dishonor the name of the Lord. Now, this is very similar to what we see in Matthew 6 in the Lord's Prayer when he says, give us this day our daily bread. It's kind of this humble dependence, Lord, I need you. Lord, I, it's not, it's my, my own self. I need you uh, I, and, and trust you in this whole situation, not myself. I don't want to be trusting in my own things. I want to be able to trust in you, but I want to be able to provide. And so it's this, Lord, make me neither rich nor make me, me poor. Hebrews 12, uh, 1 through 2 talks about this idea of sin in this. It says, therefore... Since we are uh, surrounded by uh, such a great cloud of witnesses, I want to make sure we understand this. This comes right off the context. This comes right off of Hebrews 11. If you know anything about Hebrews 11, Hebrews 11 is often called the, Hebrews, uh, uh, called the, uh, the hall of faith. It's all these people like you think of Moses, you think of, you think of Jacob, uh, you think of all these other imperfect men and imperfect women throughout Scripture that God used and by faith did all these incredible things. Abraham is in that text as well. It says, and again, it's not that I necessarily think that Abraham right now is rooting from heaven and all that. In fact, I, I don't think that's necessarily the case. He's got greater things to do than that. But I think it's this idea is that we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses to say that as Abraham was faithful, as he was able to remain faithful, even though he's imperfectly, that we can as well. And so it's so good to have uh, forefathers and, and those that have gone before us who have faithfully preached and faithfully, uh, faithfully lived out the gospel. We can do the same thing as well, and God honored them from it as well. It says, let, but let us do this. Let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that what? So easily entangles. Basically, it's so easy to get tangled up in sin. And let us run, the text says, with perseverance and the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on who? On Jesus, the pioneer, and he's the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, here's what he did. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the, the throne of God. It is so easily easy to get entangled in sin. And before we know it, we're way further. Again, this point of sin always causes more pain than we imagine. In fact, there's a text, John 8 says this, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And it says this, and the truth will set you, will set you free. You know, I think the choices we have in this life, uh, particularly when it comes to sin, is one of two things. Either we're going to have freedom or we're going to have bondage. So often we turn to things that are, are sinful, thinking it will lead us to freedom, and it leads us quite the opposite, doesn't it? We become entangled, again, that word entangled in it. And we become in bondage to the sin, and before we know it, we're like tied up. It's like, I don't want anything to do with this. I went to this thinking it would bring me freedom, but actually brings me the total opposite. And we become slaves to this sin, and, and that's not the way we are to live. In fact, we are to live in freedom uh, from that. You know, kind of thinking through the lens of, of the animal kingdom, this idea of sin always causes more pain. I, I've, 
I, I would not say I'm a fisherman, but I've done enough fishing in my time. I've never, as I fished before, I've never watched as a fish approaches uh, the line and the bait and looks at, that, it looks at that bait and considers and weighs out, should I take that bait or not, right? What do they do? Man, they attack that bait. They go after it, not even thinking of the consequences that are going to come along with it. Well, we're not animalistic in that way. Or this one, and maybe you've heard the, uh, the uh, how to boil a frog. In fact, we have a screen up there. Not, not this frog that you're about to see up there, but how to boil a frog. All right. Um, the, the, yeah, the point of boiling a frog is this, and maybe you guys know the premise of it, is that if you throw a frog or you place a frog into boiling water, what are they going to do? They're going to jump right out. But if you put it in there and it's lukewarm water and just little by little put up the temperature, they become comfortable in it. And at first, it becomes a, like a jacuzzi to them. It feels really nice. Before they know it's scalding, and they, they die, and they won't jump out of it, and they, they will actually die in that. And that's how I think sin often works for us. It's not like typically we're tempted to go all the way to this direction. In fact, well, many times we'll say, well, Lord, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to go this far, but just little by little, we do more and more. Well, we may say, Lord, I, I'll never cheat on my taxes, but I may steal a couple things from my, my company. I may do that. Or, Lord, I'm not going to, I'm never commit adultery, but, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm going to guard my eyes or, um, I'm not guarding my eyes or I may have an improper emotional relationship with somebody. And before we know it, we're in much deeper than we ever thought. Again, this idea of sin always causes more pain than we imagine. We may say, I'd never murder somebody, but we hate or we won't forgive. And before we know it, we're way further along. Sin always takes us further than we'd ever imagined. That's exactly what we see happening to Israelites. They are in this time of blessing. But yet again, they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They did not follow the commands and the precepts that the Lord had given them as far as this covenantal relationship. And before they know it, they're deep in the sin and they need a Savior. They, they're crying out for this help. Not crying out necessarily of repentance, but they're crying out because they're in so much pain. They're like, God, we need to be saved. And God provides ehud from a gift from God. There's this phrase before, uh, it's not in scripture, but it's this idea that if you give Satan an inch, he'll become your ruler. You give Satan an inch, he'll become your ruler. Ruler. In fact, your next blank is this, is that all of us battle spiritual warfare. You guys believe spiritual warfare is a real thing? You better believe it. You know, I think, I think Satan wants us to either uh, to think it doesn't exist, but it absolutely exists. There's, there's spiritual warfare happening all around us. We aren't even always aware of all that is happening around us. I think most of the time we're not even aware of it. And I have this blank in this idea of, of, this idea of dualism. This idea of dualism is like that we think maybe there's like this good and there's evil, which is true. But what I, what I want you to understand, it's not this dualism in the sense that it's not this fair fight. It's not like it's a, we, we have 50% good and 50% evil. That's not the way it works. Okay, actually, if, if, as far as the spiritual warfare, God has already defeated death on the cross of Calvary. So it's not, it's not like, it's like, well, God's got 50% chance of Satan. No, 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 we're already living in the victory. But now Satan has not ultimately been defeated once and for all yet. He will, in fact, Revelation talks about he'll eventually be thrown in this lake of fire. Right now he's the prince of this world, but we have a king. And so what, what we see is that we live in the spiritual warfare, but we don't have to live in like, well, I'm hoping I'm on the right side. No, it's not, it's, it's not a fair fight. In fact, uh, f- uh, the, Satan has limited, limited power. We, in fact, we know this. 1 John 4, 4, he says, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one that is in you is greater than he is in the world. Well, who's within us? Well, God's within us. The Holy Spirit is within us. We know that. The one that is within us is greater than he's in the world. Who's in the world? That's Satan. So it's not a fair fight. We, we are on the right side of it. If you're a follower of Christ, you are on the right side of it. And so we're to, to lean into that power. But here's what we need to know. Jesus took demons uh, uh, seriously, and so should we. But I'll tell you, the demons also took uh, Jesus seriously. So there is this spiritual warfare, warfare that we're living in, and that's why, again, sin always causes more pain than we'd imagine, and we convince ourselves, oh, it won't be that bad, or it won't cause damage, nobody's going to know, and we're lying to ourselves, because it always takes us further than we think. Now, I, I do want to say this caveat, is that I don't believe, based off of Scripture, I don't believe both Satan uh, and the Holy Spirit can indwell us at the same time. I don't think they can. I think, I think that uh, if, if the Holy Spirit's living within you, I think Satan can harass you. I think he can tempt you. I think he can trouble you. I think he can torment you. I think he can do all those things. 
but I don't, I don't think he can be indwelt in my heart if the Holy Spirit is there the whole time. So that is the confidence we have. If you have the Holy Spirit living within you, God living within you, then the Holy Spirit cannot indwell you. So again, you are, it is not this dualism. It's not this, well, I don't know who's going to win out today. No, no, no. As a believer, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. We're sealed with that Holy Spirit, so we are on the winning side of it. But we have to be careful because Satan's creeping, uh, 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 is creeping in and trying to do whatever he can to tempt, again, harass and trouble us. In fact, uh, Charles Spurgeon puts it this way. I think we'll have this on your slide. slide. Consider how precious a soul must be uh, if both God and the devil are after it. That's you. That's me. There's this passage, I, uh, Romans chapter 7. You, you keep your finger in Judges, but Romans chapter 7, it's a, it's a tongue twister. As many, many times as I've read it, even at first service today, I struggled reading through it. Uh, Romans chapter 7, uh, starting in, in verse 15. Here's, here's what it says. And I just want to con- compare and contrast. He says this, I do not understand what I do. Anybody in that ballpark ever? I don't understand what I do? I am, yeah. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is a sin living within me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, for the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is a sin living within me that does it. You guys get all that? I do, I do, I do. Yeah, thank you. First service was rough, was rough, was rough, rough, rough. But that's kind of this whole idea of, of living under the old self, under living, living under the, your own power. He's saying that's the way I live. But then he compares and contrasts. Look at verse 24 and 25. He says this, what a wretched man I am. Kind of talking about this old self. Uh, he says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject of, uh, to death? And then verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself and my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my own sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. He talks about this idea of freedom in Jesus because the victory has already been won on the cross of Calvary. That is the victory he wants to live under. That is this new nature. Uh, this, that is the new nature he wants to live under. Not of this old nature. doesn't mean that we will not still struggle with sin. We will struggle with sin until we take our very last breath. That is the nature of this world. But we don't have to live under their old nature. We live under this new nature, which he talks about in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. He says, therefore, because of all this, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of spirit who gives life has set you free from the law and the sin of death. So as the old, old comedian has said, we don't have to, the devil doesn't have to make us do it. We can't say that the devil doesn't make us do it. We cannot say that. Yes, the devil can tempt us towards it, but we always have the choice. And I want you to understand this, that the sin will always take us farther. So as you, as you have those moments of dabbling with sin, thinking nobody's going to know, maybe nobody will know right away. But it's going to take you further. It did for the Israelites. It will for us as well. Number two is this. Be ready to answer the call. Be ready to answer the call. Back into the book uh, of Judges. Again, we won't read all of it again. But 15 and 16, Ehud had to answer the call. Again, he was watching his people suffer. He was watching them suffer under the hands of these foreign nations that had them under their thumb at this point. Again, they had the freedom. They had this relationship with the Lord. And this was, this was all changed because of, of their sin. And somebody had to change. Somebody had, to, somebody had to step up and do something. And I'm sure he thought, oh, not me, not me. I, I, think, I think, again, he was thinking somebody else should do this. I, I know this is for me as well as far as this idea of answering the call. I, I know it, it, even just this idea within the church world is that I have, I have worked in churches with a lot of talented people. I've, I went to college with a lot of talented people. I've always thought, look at these other people. These are the people that God is going to use. He's not going to use somebody like me. He's going to use these more gifted people. He's going to use these people in different ways. And I've always wanted to kind of shy, take a step back thinking God will use them and not him. And I wonder if Ehud kind of had that thought as well. God is going to use somebody else not me, but at this point moment, he thought, it's got to be me. I'm going to answer the call. But sometimes answering the call of God is hard. Part of it is because uh, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot happening. Just like for you, if you're trying to answer a, a phone call in a loud lobby, 
Like you can't really hear and you just kind of give up. Sometimes we're so busy in life, we're just going, 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 and even doing good things that we can't even hear from God, which is part of the reason why it's good to, to get away, whether that's in the morning or the evening, and just get into his word or quiet your spirit or listening to worship music or in prayer, whatever those things may be, and say, God, speak to me. God, I want to I hear your voice. He most often speaks through his word. And so, Lord, I want to do what you call me to do. Ehud, again, answered the call. And by him answering the call, he was able to lead them back. And again, in a very mighty, powerful way. But it wasn't Ehud's. While he did it uh, with his left hand, we recognize it was the Lord that led him. Because the Lord wouldn't have led him, he would not have, been, he would not have had a victory in this. Revelation 3.20. You guys know this text. Probably many of you know this text. It says this. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And again, this reminder, this is God speaking to this church. This is a church he's talking about, the church of Laodicea. They were comfortable. They, they were kind of comfortable in themselves and all that. And he was saying, don't be complacent. Instead, he, that God persistently knocks on the door of our heart. He's going to knock. But he won't always force his way in. God does give us his free will. And God may knock and knock and knock, persistently knock. I don't know about you, there have been times where I've known I was supposed to do something. Uh, I've known it from his word, I've known it from his spirit, and I've had peace about it, but yet I'm scared, I'm terrified, so I don't do it, and that persistent thought keeps coming in my mind, that persistent thing keeps showing up in scripture. Has that ever happened to anybody in this room? It's like, God, i got to do this, I know that you're calling me to do this, I don't want to, but I'm going to do it. I wonder if that's the situation Ehud was doing, uh, was in, and eventually he answered the call, which leads to the third thing, uh, be ready in spite of the weakness. Now, I don't want to overplay this card, but again, this idea in this society to be left-handed was looked at as most likely as a disability, was looked at most likely as something you wouldn't be proud of. Yet God used it in a way, in a very mighty, powerful way. Again, so much so that if he would have been right-handed, he would have been checked at the doors there, but he was not. And God used it in a, a, a very uh, amazing way. I just talked about this idea a, a moment ago, is that so often God uses our weaknesses uh, in, in a mighty way. That God doesn't always use the people that are most likely to succeed. You know, it's, it's just even interesting. I look at uh, some of the guys I, I, and people I went to college with thinking that they would be the ones that are, they had the most, they had the most prominent gifts. They were the, most, they were the most charismatic ones. And sometimes that doesn't necessarily mean that those are the ones that God was going to use in a mighty way. Because it, it has more to do with the heart than it does to do with our gifts and abilities, right? Like, again, there are some people that are like extremely, extremely gifted. But yet, if our heart's not in it, it won't matter. God's not going to honor that. God's going to honor it as our hearts are in it. And what I, what I find so interesting is, is that God uses these gifts. We won't take time to read this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 through 11. Uh, Deanne mentioned it at, the, at the beginning, we're going to have a class on May 19th that talks about this idea, what your spiritual gift is. You absolutely should be use, utilizing the spiritual gift that God has given you. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you aren't going to be stretched. In fact, so often you won't know you have the spiritual gift until you, until you do these things, until you, you take a step of faith. Okay, there's rarely does somebody just stand on stage and, and preach the gospel and they're, they're Billy Graham the first time they do it. That doesn't happen like that. Oftentimes you've got to do it time and time again. Whatever that gift and ability is, you kind of got to exercise that gift. And God, and God uses it in the purpose of spiritual gifts and what you'll learn on that day, and again, I want to remind you, is, is not to build yourself up. The purpose of spiritual gifts is always to build the church up. And so that's why I'm so thankful with all the people here. We have different gifts and abilities. I'm so glad we have people that have a variety of gifts and abilities to build up this church so more people would know about Jesus and so more people would grow up in their faith in Jesus Christ. That is what the purpose of these gifts are. And so we need to be ready. In spite of our weakness, there, there's a passage that talks about this idea that it's where God is, where we are weak, there is He is strong. So it's trusting and trusting Him. There's that whole cliche, God doesn't call the equip, but He equips the call. Do you believe that? Do you believe that where, where God's going to lead you, where God's going to lead you, He's going to guide you, He's going to direct you, He's going to give you the things that you need. Do you trust Him? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a point of, for us of an act of faith. Saying, all right, Lord, I don't see it. I don't see how you're going to do anything here. I don't see how you're going to work in this situation. I don't see how you're going to use me, but I'm, going to, I'm trusting that you put me in this position. I'm trusting that you've led me to this. And again, if this is not the position I'm going to be, I'm going to trust you're going to move me a different direction, but I'm going to trust you in this. That is what faith looks like. And there are all of us need to, particularly when it comes to a point of our faith, we need only to at some point be a point where we're a little bit scared, a little bit nervous saying, Lord, I don't know. 
I don't know how this is going to happen. I'm going to follow you and do what you have called me to do. There's something about that. It makes, it's, it's exciting. It's scary, but it's exciting. I remember hearing a preacher talk about uh, his very first time preaching, and he, was, and he was in front of all these people, and he said, and he came up there, and he said he did like the worst sermon. It was terrible. It was like seven, eight minutes. It was a horrible sermon, and he, and he went back there, and he's like, that was the scariest thing I've ever done. When do I get to do it again, right? It's that idea. Like, I, this is scary, but I, I want to do it again. Lord, you, you've called me to evangelize. That was the scariest thing I ever did, but I can't wait to do it again. That's kind of the spirit that we need to have of saying, on my own, I can't do it, but you can work through me, and you give me the words to say, you help me through it. Like, there's no more powerful place to be. Where we are weak, he is is strong. You know, again, I talked about this idea that God often used the people that are not most likely to succeed. David wasn't the son of Jesse that should have killed Goliath, right? I mean, if you looked at him, you, if you lined them all up and thought, who's the one to get it? He wouldn't be the one. Saul would have uh, been much more uh, able, uh, and other people at that time would have been much more able to, to kill Goliath. But yet God used David, or I think of Paul. Paul talks about that he was an untrained speaker, but yet he was the greatest missionary our world has ever seen. God can use it in that way. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Not our mighty power, but his mighty power. And then you're blank there. Put on the full armor of God. And that armor of God is talked about in the following verses so that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. He says this, for our struggle, a reminder, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But remember the spiritual warfare idea, idea, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Which leads to the very last point. Number four is this. Be ready as the enemy gets defeated. It says in this t- text, the very end of it, that 10,000 Moabites uh, were killed. Again, this is a mighty group of, of people that were killed. And it wasn't by their own success. It would have only been the hand of God that would have led them towards that. James 4, 7 puts it this way. Submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What does it mean to resist the devil? Does it mean to run? Well, sometimes it does. Sometimes we are to flee situations, but other times it just means I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise him in this difficult time. Lord, I'm going to uh, not just simply going to praise you. I'm going to I'm going to read your word. Lord, I'm going to pray uh, to you. Lord, I'm going to I'm going to honor you. I'm going to I'm going to worship you in all I do. That's what it is. sometimes when we feel like we have this spiritual warfare going on, the best activity we can do is to praise God and say, God, I, I pray, I pray that in your power and your strength that Satan will be bound and I'm going to worship, I'm going to honor you and we have these moments of spiritual warfare where we need to look to him. Again, fixing our eyes on he, on him because the sin can so easily entangle us. It's so easy just to turn to what Satan calls us to do, but instead we say, no, 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 I want to follow your precepts. I want to follow your commands. I want to call, follow what you've called me to do. And so we turn to his word. We turn to prayer. We turn to praise. We turn to his community. You know, that's part of the reason why Hebrews 10.25 talks about this idea to, that uh, don't quit meeting together. Some are in the habit of doing. There are days it's easy to say, I'm just going to skip church. I don't want to be here. I don't want to, I don't want to watch. I don't want to do that. But there's a point to it. There's part of it is, is, is for yourself to show up, but also you're showing up to help encourage the people around you. You don't know what kind of the weeks they've had around you. And part of our job is to encourage, to spur one another, especially the scripture says, as the day approaches. Because we're a day sooner that Christ's going to return. We don't know when Christ's going to return. We're ready for that day, amen? We're ready for him to return. Very last few words of Revelation, come Lord Jesus, come. We're praying that day is soon, but until he comes again, We're to encourage one another, spur one another on in our faith and be ready as the enemy gets defeated. Now, I want to say this. Probably you don't have 10,000 men standing outside your door ready to attack you. That's probably not what's going on. So much of us is probably more of a mental, emotional, spiritual warfare we're going through. And what I want to encourage you in in those moments is is as we look at this this text here, is saying, Lord, I want to follow. I'm ready to answer the call. Lord, I want to be ready. Even in my weakness, Lord, I want to be ready. And Lord, I I want to follow what you've called me to do. And recognizing when I do sin, even Scripture talks about in 1 John, when we do sin, we have a Savior who is who's willing and ready to forgive us. That doesn't mean we sin on purpose, absolutely not. But we have this grace that is there that when we do fall and when we do sin, he is there to forgive us. And so this is the direction that we are to go uh, in this and be ready as the enemy gets defeated. I've watched it time and time again in my own life and in so many others' lives. 
that as, as struggling through sin and struggling through spiritual warfare, that as we submit to the Lord, doesn't mean our paths always get easy, but yet we, we can recognize God's hand all over leading us through a really difficult time or through a really difficult season. You know, we started this text with this idea in Judges chapter 3, verse 16. That's kind of where we've been in this 316 idea. And it says in here, uh, my daughter asked me today why I chose this passage and everything. Verse 16, and again, I don't want to make, I don't want to go too far with this idea, but I, I do think this is interesting. It says, now Ehud had made a double-edged sword. That's not the only time scripture talks about a double-edged sword. In fact, look on your screens here. Hebrews 4.12 says this, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And this idea of, of a double-edged sword, as you guys know in your blank there, is that a, a double-edged sword, the Word of God, is powerful. And here's why. There's that idiom that says that, that, the, uh, that, that a double-edged sword it, is something that can cut both ways. And I think the Word of God in my life does it. It cuts both ways. There are times that as I read the Word of God, and this is, to the best of my understanding, this is what this idea of double-edged sword means, that there are times I read the Word of God that I'm comforted. When I read passages like uh, Psalm 23, that the Lord is my shepherd, that David was, himself was a shepherd, and he understood he needed a shepherd, that brings me comfort. When I read passages like 2 Corinthians 1 that talks about that he is the God of all comforts, who comforts us in our times of trouble so that we, in turn, can help others with that same comfort we receive. When I read passages like Romans 8, 28, that God's going to work everything for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. There are just a few of them. Titus talks about this blessed hope we have. When I read these passages, I think of this idea that, that the word of God can comfort the afflicted. But here's what I also know to be true, that the word of God can afflict the comfortable. There are times that I become too comfortable in my faith, and as I read it, again, if you look at some, especially my older Bibles, I have the words, ouch, right next to it. I have the word ouch next to it. And that's not saying that I, as I have the word ouch in there, it doesn't mean that, well, I hope Daryl Roosevelt reads these words because he really needs to hear it because he needs to be convicted by it. No, no, no. The word ouch there is written for myself because as I read it, it steps on my toes. The word of God should step on your toes, should make you at times feel a little bit uncomfortable saying, I need to move, I need to, I need to, be, I need to, ch I need to change the course because if I follow my carnal nature, exactly what we see in Romans chapter 7 where Paul says, I do the things I don't want to do, what a wretched man I am, we don't want to live in that. Instead, we want to live in that freedom of Christ. That the law of sin no longer has the power. In fact, instead, it's the grace and mercy of, of Christ that was done on the cross of Calvary for us. I'm the worship team. Come on up here. You know, one of the things that I also want to mention is one of the things that is cool about the Old Testament, you know, we, we, we use the Old Testament quite often. One of the things I think is, is really cool about it is that we see these types and shadows that really, in a lot of ways, Jesus is all over the Old Testament. Even though Jesus is revealed, there's a, the talk of the Messiah, there's all these, actually, there's 300 plus messianic prophecies in the Old Testament, but New Testament is where Jesus arrives on the scene. But there's this idea in the Old Testament we see, we see this idea of types and shadows all over the Old Testament, we see these types and shadows, and it's basically this pointing towards a Messiah that was going to come. And one of the things that we see in this book of Judges is that the, some of these judges, Othniel, Ehud, some of these other ones, they were imperfect, but they're kind of a type and shadow. That these judges would come and in a lot of ways come and save the day, would come and save Israel. But it was a type and shadow, a pointing towards a day that there would be a better Messiah that would come, a better Savior, a better judge that would come, and that is Jesus Christ. And so as wonderful for the Israelites these judges were, we have a greater judge. We have a greater Messiah. We have a greater Savior in Jesus. And if you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you've never repented of your sins, you've never entered the waters of, of baptism, we'd love to talk to you about what it means to have a saving relationship with Jesus. Not just Him as your Savior, but Him as Lord of your life. And to say, Lord, I submit all my ways. I submit everything to You. If you've never made that decision, man, we'd love to talk to you about it, what it means to make Him Lord and Savior. If you just need prayer, if you can kind of see yourself where the Israelites are, and maybe in part, where you're feeling like, man, I've just been turning, I've been turning away, and Lord, I'm crying out to You. Again, you don't need to cry out to a judge. You don't need to cry out to a priest. You don't need to cry out to a minister. You, know you cry out to? You cry out to the Lord. And we know the veil was torn at Jesus. It tore that veil. And we have, uh, Hebrews talks about we have this access. We have this access because of what Jesus had done to us. And so maybe you need to come up here. Maybe you just need prayer. We'll have some prayer support people up here as well that would love to pray. I hope you're not at a point where you're too prideful to think not a single one of us isn't, doesn't need prayer, doesn't, need, doesn't go through struggles. We all do. 
in this world, you will face trouble. And you better believe the moment you take a step for Jesus, you better believe spiritual warfare is coming. It will come. Satan will do whatever he can to take you off that cross, but, or take you, off, take you off that path. But it's this confidence of this, is that we fix our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter of faith. Man, then, then we, we're going in that right direction. Or if you just need a church home, we'd love nothing more for you to be here. Again, we are a perfect uh, group of people, but we're following a perfect Savior. And we are always so thankful for this opportunity to be able to come together to encourage, to challenge, to inspire one another, especially even more as we see the day approaching. So there's time of invitation. Would you stand as we, as we sing together? And if you need to make a decision, would you come?